new. Uh, nope, it's not doing the right thing. Let me try that again. Audience window. All right, I think we should be good to go. We've got the right window this time. All right, well, we, um, mine is related to online learning policy post COVID. And originally I had um, really wanted to analyze each of the policies, but through my phase one of the research, I learned some things uh, which shifted into looking at the academic considerations across the CSU for all of last year. Um, so I'll get there. Um, all right, so as we've all shared, um, obviously our pandemic context really increased our online modalities. Um, and then there seemed to be some individuals, um, and I'm just speaking of how this sort of came up, but in relationship to um, my um, university is that um, there was a mix, there was a very heated uh, debate on like, were no online classes for anyone, or we should get to just teach whatever we want, like completely like that. <laughs> and so that was showing up um, through some task force work. And um, so I thought it would be interesting to really look at the realities. Were we the only site? My hunch was probably not. And after getting to share space with everyone here, um, it started to emerge that these things were happening, um, but they were happening at different spots throughout the year. And that became very telling in my review of the minutes. Um, also, there's always this piece back to accreditation around that 50% or more of the program and all of the interesting ways that that's interpreted um, and the conversation. So that also became kind of this core of the problem and like how it's being interpreted and the, the different ways <laughs> which created it. So that'll go into it. So my first step was um, to really dive into what's the landscape of online teaching and learning as far as policies concerned which then I thought my step two originally was going to be using the um, really great analysis rubric that I found for policy um, specific to online education and, and looking through those pieces. But what I found is um, was actually even more interesting in that um, there, there's policies that are still being written and um, revised in Senate's as of just the end of May and are going into next year. So um, I think that's gonna be a great process for next year um, as we start to see these ones wrap up. So I shifted to look at what the prominent considerations were related to online teaching and learning. Kind of, I, I shifted away from the words concerns because it was more, I mean, sometimes they, they highlight it as concerns, but it was more like, hey, these are the things we need to be thinking about as we move forward. Um, and just trying to take a, a positive uh, asset lens as I was looking through so many minutes, which um, I learned about what every school has been focused on <laughs> over this year, and it hasn't all been on technology. So um, I used a two-phase qualitative document review of the 22-23 Senate minutes um, across all the universities. One of the universities I was unable to access the documents, um, I so kindly emailed out to the president and she's new and said, oh my gosh, we're having so many technical issues. And um, I just thought, well, I'm not gonna worry about it right now. She's like, sometime in the summer, we'll get it fixed. Um, so here nor there, that one just was thrown out, but I got to review 21 sets of minutes for entire year. Um, uh, year. And I started coding, open coding, and then from there went to frequencies um, because what I started to see were very common codes to help us understand. I think it, through a deeper dive and deeper into policy, then we can have some larger theme, themes, although there's enough for conclusions um, when we look across the, the, the codes. Um, but again, I was looking for general policy landscape, um, and I'll get into what that looked like. And then um, I left it there, concerns or considerations. So when looking at the 21 um, sites, um, there was evidence, updates, modifications, and considerations to online learning um, within the last academic year of 14 of those. Um, and 50% of those, so seven, 
are continuing to move the policies and continuing review in the academic Senate in the fall. Uh, one of those was, a re was up for review in the fall and the rest of them were because of consistent red line revisions and going through, which I also read through all of those to understand the nuances. Um, one thing that's interesting, the titles for these are all over the map, even off your original list, um, Ashley, we saw that change. Um, but from that, uh, five of the, those 14 who are moving for policy updates are actually going to be changing titles. And what the changes that we saw, or I started to note, um, well, in my word cloud, you can see some of the, the most common terms are online instruction, hybrid, uh, courses and learning and teaching. Um, so mostly online hybrid. There were some e couples uh, sites use e-learning, um, technology, technology mediated and modes of instruction and so forth. So you can look at those there. But the shifts I saw for, for schools, um, and there's only four listed because one was similar, they were the same change, but just using the language from distributed to distance learning, technology mediated to online, a distance being changed to online hybrid, and in the term instruction in two schools moving from instruction to courses. Um, and there's some nuances there related to where the policy should lie um, related to how we teach versus the content and how the courses are structured and uh, that piece. So that's where a lot of that Slide. But again, we've got to kind of wait and see what ends up happening. All right, so 20 out of the 21 sites highlighted considerations related to online policies. So maybe they weren't uh, going through to change them yet, but there were considerations and concerns that were brought up. Um, and so I then coded or open coded, and then I went through school by school and checked through it and kind of did a double uh, cross on that. And what I found is the top four considerations that were brought up across the campuses is 11 campuses uh, raised concerns related to modality purview. So where does that modality, um, when we're having a course move to an online or hybrid or high flex or by Kunis and all of this, where does the purview lie? And at what point does it stay within the department? what point does it move to the college level committees um, beyond? Um, and, and a lot of concern about overreach and wh who's maybe not stated that way, but I'm, I'm summarizing, right? But those were some of the big concerns um, there. 10 out of 21 raised concerns about course con and content approval processes. So somewhat linked to purview. Um, but really when I'm talking about modality purviews, like, okay, so when we're scheduling, where, where does that like instantaneous work happen? When we look here, this is like new courses or modified courses, when and how do those get approved and who, who's doing the approving were um, areas of concern. Eight out of 21 raised concerns about modality weights. So all over the place related to, and it goes back to that 50% rule, um, related to what constitute constitutes various percentages. And within those percentages, what about finals? Can those be online or face-to-face -face if it's an online? And a lot, of, a lot of conversation around clarity for the weights and then what implications that has for field trips for um, other types of things. Um, and then eight out of 10 um, raise concerns related to terminology. The two biggest changes I saw were related to adding high flex. And um, one in, institution talked about bi bikerness, which was brought up in our meeting here. I think that's the one university, but um, mostly high flex. And then um, really thinking about hybrid and what that means specifically and finding ways to, to navigate that, that space. Looking across all of them for, for interest, um, you can see then from there on, there's seven universities in, and below. So it's just, it's listed by topic, but I'll just lightly go over um, really concerns around flexibility for programs because some programs um, like, you, like was shared just earlier um, related to like education 
Um, there's a, there was a lot of intensity uh, there, particularly for education courses because students are doing their student teaching during the whole day and they don't necessarily wanna to come to class. So that's an, one example, there were others as well. So, you know, just being worried that we don't have policy that then limits programs where, you know, there's needs with that. Um, the idea of WASC and accreditation was brought up at seven universities. And a one that I didn't expect, but I should have, I guess, in the new nature, but this also shows the changes is what, um, what areas related to AI and what does that, how might that impact our, um, our policies? And then you can see the rest there. And then, um, so um, just to wrap it up, uh, basically our policies are continuing to evolve and emerge into next fall. Um, and there's various concerns that are happening. The most prominent um, of, or the top four that listed, and even just looking across all of them is really considerations related to modality and oversight, and then acknowledging that our terminology is changing rapidly and how do we account for that? Um, Cause that's really important. I think as we move forward and just continue into this research, because I think it's important to continue to monitor these policies, one, to update the website on the chancellor's office, but two, so that we can continue to get a better, a better scope of the landscape once things are decided. I think it's important as leaders um, and work and faculty that we find this balance between flexibility, student need for enrollment, but then also course quality and then expectations because tenure density was another area. Um, expectations, why should it be different than face-to-face? -face? A lot of concerns around that. Um, so, so these are all need to continue to be at the forefront. And just remembering there's contextual factors, of course, because our universities have you know, niches that are important, but we also have shared concerns um, that are valid and how can we leverage our work together? And that is everything. And I have uh, my information too, if anyone wants to reach out or wants to do some collab work for next year, that would be fun.